So the children had a great time at Strong Museum yesterday and uh, a wonderful time. Uh, they have a wonderful time, I know, at Brick Lab. Brick Lab is, is kind of a place filled with Legos. And that'll be uh, next Saturday. And uh, the children will meet at the church at 845 and uh, leave by 9 o'clock to go to Brick Lab. And they'll be there for about two hours. So uh, again, just a, a great time of, of fun and fellowship uh, that they'll have. And, and we hope to, to read the Jesus Storybook Bible before he leaves. And so um, just um, a lot of exciting things. Of course, related to all that, to Children's Ministries, is VBS. And so uh, real excited about that. And so if you have the opportunity, please sign up. Um, and you see the dates there. And if you uh, don't feel led to, to, to lead in helping out with children, uh, just come and serve somehow, some way, even... Um, with meal cleanup or anything like that, uh, just be a great time of, of opportunity for us as, as a church to fellowship and really reach out to our community, especially our children and our families within our community. And so, uh, just real excited about that. And so, just please uh, keep keep that in mind. So, um, a lot of exciting things we have going on, especially children wise for the summer. And so, um, let's just uh, bow our hearts in prayer as we come to Him and thank Him for all that He's doing. Heavenly Father, just come to you this morning and praise and we thank you so much for uh, everything that we have going on in the life of our church, especially if we have opportunities to, to reach out to our community. And so, Lord, we just pray that uh, you give us uh, just the uh, encouragement and the strength just to, to reach out to, to our world, especially as we talk about today. It's, it's a different, much different culture than the way we're accustomed to. And so, Lord, we pray you give us wisdom and the knowledge and the strength to do that and so that we might share the good news of the gospel with the world that so desperately needs it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're able to, please stand for opening scripture, which is from John chapter 17, verses 13 through 17. John chapter 17, verses 13 through 17. Jesus is speaking here. So hear now the word of God. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Good morning. Let's worship the Lord in song. I live in for the foundation of stone. I live in Zion for the foundation of stone. A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, a sure foundation, a tried stone. A precious cornerstone in the believer shall not make haste. In the believer shall not make haste. I lay time. I lay time for the foundation of stone.
My great and awesome God, I come to you with a humble heart and pray. Oh Lord, my great and awesome God, I come to you and honor you today. Oh Lord, 
Oh Lord, my great and awesome God, I come to you with a humble heart and pray. Oh Lord, my great and awesome God, I come to you. And honor you today With a heart of love I worship With my lips I sing your praise I give my life to you I come to you And honor you, my Lord Oh Lord My great and awesome God, I come to you with a humble heart and pray. Oh Lord, my great and awesome God, I come to you and honor you to With a heart of love I worship, with my lips I sing your praise, I give my life to you, I come to you and honor you. I sing your praise, I give my life to you, I come to you, I come to you, I come to you, and honor you, my Lord, I come to you. Come to you. I come to you and honor you, my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Bill and Renee. Uh, so we uh, will read responsively um, from your from our P Bibles, page 1249. That's selection 21. That's taken from Psalm 119. And as we do so, the children can come forth. Um, so in a responsive reading, I will read the light print, and you can read the dark print together. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much in, as in all riches. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. So, how are y'all today? Good. I have some books. 
you saw, exactly. Oh, really? Which one do you, which one? Oh, Humphrey. Yes, so our boys love Humphrey. So there's, <laughs> so that was, so hold on, sit down. Jeremiah says he has every single one. So, so we read, yeah, yeah. So I try and read a lot to 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 you guys, and so we have a lot of books that are here, and so just kind of go through some, and so um, which one is this? The doll. It's it's the doll people, right? Which one though is this specifically? The meanest doll in the world. That was a fun book. Um, so uh, and so, of course, we have Humphrey, which is um, about a a hamster, right? And so about all his adventures and everything like that. And then this is oftentimes uh, stink. There's also um, one called called Judy uh, Judy Bloom or something like that, I think. Um, and so about a sister. But my boys really like the stink books, and this is this is kind of actually when we went through our guinea pig phase as a family. That's over with now. But um, but this one was stink and the Greg Guinea Pig Express. All those guinea pigs, exactly. There's a lot of guinea pigs, and so exactly. And these are some of the books that they read uh, for school. Um, Neil Arm about Neil Armstrong. And Amelia Earhart. That was a big that quite a yeah. So all of these books are important, and um, they're one might be able to you might call them narratives, right? Um, because they tell stories. Now these books are what's called fiction, right? And these books are biographies, and they're also called nonfiction, right? And they also turn to, to tell a narrative as well. So that's important because today we're going to talk about what's called a meta narrative. So, so let's first of all let's think about what a narrative is. A narrative is something that tells a story, right? And of course, in the case of nonfiction books or biographies, they tell a true story. But what's a meta narrative? First of all, what's what what does meta mean? If I say meta, what am I saying? I say, wow, that's meta. What am I saying? Uh, you don't know? How about big? That was way too loud. So sorry. So, all right. So, it's big. It's huge. It's a huge, massive story. It's a big narrative. And so, that's... The Bible is one of them. Now, unlike unlike these stories, um, the Bible is true, right? These are the fiction, and of course, the Bible though is um, is all true, completely, and one hundred percent, and infallible in everything that it says, right? That's true too. But what's important to know and understand that this is even more true. In other words, there might be mistakes in this book, but there's no mistakes in this book. Yeah, yeah, and so, but this book we know for certain is without a doubt completely true in everything that it says and does. And it has what's called a meta-narrative in it. In other words, there's a very large story, there's a very large point to everything that it talks about. What is that? What does the Bible really, really talk about more than anything else? Jesus, right? It's all... And, God's, and, and it talks about God, and, but it talks about Jesus. It talks about the gospel. It talks about Jesus dying on the cross for us and, and rising from the dead for us. And so, and coming to faith in Jesus. And that's all that this book is about. And that is the meta-narrative, the very large story that has, that's very true. Yes. Exactly. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to write about that up. So this is, yeah. So so this is this is not necessarily the Bible, 
but I love this because this is what we talk about during Kids Quest and things like that. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. And it tells stories of the Bible. And I really like it because every single time that we read it, it points back to this meta narrative about Jesus. Every single story in here points to us towards Jesus. And it tells us that Jesus is everything. And that's what the Bible, of course, points to. And the author here, Sally Lowe Jones, does a wonderful job of every time that she talks about something, she always relates it back to Jesus. So that in your minds and your hearts, you understand what everything is about, how everything points back to Jesus Christ. Okay? And so that's real important. And we're going to talk today about this. I know it's a big, scary sign and word, meta narrative, but it's really not. All it means is it's, it, that everything has a purpose to it. And that purpose is what God has for us. Um, and its purpose is found in Jesus Christ. Okay? So I'm going to pray for you guys and um, pray. Yeah, it's the same book. It's a different, it's a different edition. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, just this morning, just lift up these little ones in prayer and ask you that um, they come to know and understand who Jesus is and what he means to them. And so that they uh, can grow up and even despite everything that's going on in their culture around them, that they truly come to know and understand Jesus as their Savior and um, truly understand that he is uh, all in all and uh, he means everything to them if they would just but turn to him. And so, Lord, we lift these little ones up to you, uh, even as we lift up ourselves and ask you that we truly understand um, and teach them all about Jesus and what he means to them. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you, guys. You can go back and sit down now. Okay. For our time of prayer this morning, uh, we are certainly uh, praying for Mike and Paula. Um, Paula, of course, as we have been praying over, she has a brain tumor. Um, the prognosis looks a little bit more positive, um, but she will have uh, surgery on Thursday. And so she, she and Mike really, really wanted to be here this morning, um, but uh, we're not able to, just she's very weak. But she wants you as a congregation, as a church family, to know how much uh, she appreciates you and how much she, that they both appreciate all the love and care and concern that you've reached out to them. And so just please be in prayer, uh, especially on Thursday as she has surgery. And, um, and I know, again, that they, that they long to, to be here. I, I'm sure they're, they're listening. Um, and uh, so uh, Mike and Paula and all of their family, uh, just know that we're praying for you. So for our time of prayer this morning, uh, I want us to consider a um, passage from Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and this is important as we talk about post postmodernism and what it means for us that, that we don't get caught up in it. Um, we'll talk about all that. I know it's big words and so forth, but um, they're important to know and understand so that we ourselves don't get caught up in understanding. We know for certain that there is a truth and that's found in God's word. And uh, so Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, uh, God's word says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift up all prayer concerns to you, those that were spoken and those not spoken, Lord, we, we know that we can go through difficult times in our lives, uh, difficult situations, and sometimes we don't know how to put into words a prayer request, how to write them on paper, but you know our hearts, you know our struggles, you know our cares, our worries, and we lift these things up to you, Lord. We also lift up those who have lost loved ones. Um, during and uh, oftentimes during the summer um, that it can be um, a little bit more difficult as we think about loved ones. We especially think of, of Kay Harmon and all those who, who miss Ron so terribly. And so, Lord, we lift them up in, in prayers and ask your watch care over them. Um, we uh, turn our attention, Lord, to, uh, to Mike and Paula. And, uh, Lord, we've been 
praying for uh, about a week and a half or so for, for a miracle now. And we pray that that will happen. We pray, Lord, you give the doctors the wisdom and the skill uh, to heal Paula completely. But, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for her faith that's so very strong and powerful. And that even in the midst of, of, of the hospital, Lord, she was, she was sharing her faith. And uh, just thank you and we praise you for that, that have how remarkable her, her faith in you is. And, and the same thing for, Mike, for Michael as well. And uh, so, Lord, we just pray for them. We pray that you give the darshas the wisdom and the skill, and that more than anything, Lord, you, as you, your wonderful physician, might, if it be your will, Lord, might reach out and heal her completely. And uh, just lift her up in prayers and ask you in the midst of, of all the, the struggles that, that she and Mike is going through right now and all of her family, just pray your, your watch care over them. And as they... Um, to struggle mightily with this, um, with, with all this, Lord. And we pray that the brain tumor might be taken away. And uh, the doctors think that there's going to be a little bit of that stuff that's left. And we pray that, um, that that will be taken away completely somehow, some way. And so, Lord, we just lift them up in prayers. Uh, thank you, Lord, for their faith. Thank you, Lord, for their witness. And just pray that uh, your watch care over them. We turn our attention to your word, and we think of Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, of how we are to not take anything captive by philosophy and an empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elementary, elementary spirits of the world, and not according to Christ, that whether it's postmodernism or, as we'll look at next week, metamodernism or any other ism surrounding us, uh, anything that contradicts your word, anything that carries us away, anything that we see within music, movies, the media, the news, social media, all these things that we're bombarded with, things that are separate from you. And so, Lord, we, as a church family, pray that we ourselves, as we seek to witness to our culture around us, we ourselves would not be caught up in these things, but rather we le learn to consistently, constantly lean upon you all of our days of our life so that we in turn might be salt and light to a world around us, that we might share the good news of the gospel of Jesus, how others might have the same salvation we have found in you. In Christ's name we have found, we pray. Amen. Mike and Paula, we love you and we'll see you soon. Please stand up. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Lay it all down again. To hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do. There's nothing else could take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find a way. Bring me back to you. You're all I want. Desire. 
you are my desire. No one else, else will, will do. Nothing, Nothing else, else could, could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, bring me back to you. You're all I want, all I want. You're all I ever needed. Jesus, you're all I want. Help me know you are near. You're all I want, you're all I want. You're all I ever need, Jesus. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. Help me know you are near. Help me know you. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise, Lord, for all good things. Lord, and Lord. For touching us is only the only way that you can. To your glory and honor, Lord, may our hearts be turned to you. We look to you, Lord, and we pray that you use our pastor to minister to us on your behalf. Lord, that your word comes forth with power. Lord, may you be glorified, you and you alone. We pray in Jesus' name, Yeshua. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to my favorite book of the Bible, Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3, and um, read the whole passage, but it will be just a bit before we get to that, though. Uh, the reason is, is because... We all want to kind of set the groundwork for the reason why we're looking at Ecclesiastes, particularly Ecclesiastes 3 this morning. That is, what we're doing is we're looking at evangelism, and uh, last week we looked at, um, at a context of evangelism and understanding that, okay, our approach uh, might be different today, uh, might be different, um, for instance, in, the, in Mississippi, where I'm from, than, than here. As I said last week, I'm not really going to dwell on that because... I'm from Mississippi, and you guys are, should tell me, okay, what Western New York is like. I mean, I'm, I'm learning, been close to here about five years now or so, but, um, you know, the context of Western New York is, is more what you guys know more than, than myself. So I want us to think, though, about the day and age that we live in. And most people who study such things think that um, we, we had – what's called modernism, until, I don't know, some people say about 1980 or so, some people say a little, a little earlier. Um, I'm, it's kind of impossible to put a date on that. And others will say that, okay, that's really ended and metamodernism is where we're at now, which is what we'll talk about next week. I know these are big words. Um, I know that that's like, okay, why are we talking about this? Because this is real important to know and understand so that when you talk to people, you know what's coming across in movies, television shows, social media, music, uh, you name it. There's nothing that these things don't touch. And we need to understand what the message is and what's getting across. So to do that, we first need to understand what a meta narrative is. As I share with the children, a meta narrative is a very large story. Um, but in the case of Scripture, it's a true story, as Scripture is infallible. And the meta narrative basically means that, that what the Bible is showing us is that there is a purpose in everything. And it's namely pointing us to Jesus Christ. And if you see the definition that I found from gotquestions.org, a meta narrative, also called a grand narrative, is an overarching story or storyline that gives context, meaning, and purpose to all of life. A meta narrative is a big picture, all encompassing theme that unites all smaller themes and in individual stories. 
Now that specifically is what postmodernism rejects. It dislikes what's this meta narrative, in other words, this purpose to everything. Because what they tend to say is they tend to say that your truth is different than my truth, which of course is nonsense, which in is itself is, is meant to be a truthful statement. So how can that even be? If my truth is different from your truth, then that in itself is is a seek to say truth. But um, Sam Chan does a great job in his book about reaching out to people in a skeptical world, and he lists characteristics of postmodernism. And I'll uh, kind of go through these quickly and talk about them. Uh, first, is shaped by the variables of culture, history, race, experience, and education. In other words, um, who I am. I'm a white person, white male person from Mississippi, and everything about that has shaped me, and that's who I am, and so forth. And so it tends to look at everybody and everything and the context of, of, of who they are and their race, their, their gender, their, um, what they, their economic background, anything and everything. And, and of course, so talk about, I mean, look, those things are important, but oftentimes postmodernism can can put way too much emphasis on those things. Um, second thing, each truth is free floating, unanchored, and not founded upon a prior truth. You have your truth, and I'll have my truth. That, of course, is nonsense. That again, you'll have my truth, and I'll have your truth. That in itself is a seek to say a truthful statement. And so that is the biggest thing about postmodernism that it doesn't have any anchor or anything like that. Um, and it doesn't even make any sense if you carry it out. All method is, is biased and subjective. It's our presuppositions that determine the outcome. In other words, when I, especially when this is true when it comes to Scripture, they tend to think when I come to Scripture that the, my understanding of it has been shaped my, by my presuppositions by the way that I think. Now, to a certain extent, I understand that. Okay? Um, with that being said, we must understand that this is infallible. This is the very word of God. And it, it has the truth within it. And they would say, no, you know, everything, 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 every single amount of truth is tainted by presuppositions, by your background, your race, you, you name it. Um, the next is certainty of knowledge kind of goes along with that. Certainty of knowledge is impossible. Again, because we all have our presuppositions. We all have all these things, and so you can't know for certain about anything. And again, because there's no truth. Because your truth is different than my truth. Science itself is now viewed as, as a biased construction, construction of, of facts from established authority figures, so its premises and conclusions can't be trusted, uh, can't, be can't necessarily be trusted. Now, and he talks about in the book about how that has risen to different um, homeopathic ideas and so forth, um, according to medicine. And look, it's, I'm not certainly saying if you approach to your health and so forth is more natural than anything, uh, that's fine. I'm not judging that. But I do think number five is important because what that tells us, it shows us that those who hold to this philosophy, and again, it's found in music, it's found in movies, it's found in academics, it's found in universities, you name it, name something. And I promise you, somewhere along the way, postmodernism has touched it. Along with that is not only distrust in science, but it's a distrust in all institutions, every single institution, including what? Church. Okay? That's important because there's this distrust in church. And again, number six, there's no universal truth. So especially if we as a church say this Bible is true, Postmodernists will say no. So, when we think about that, and again, this isn't everything that we do, and we'll talk next week about how it's, it's kind of morphed into this metamodernism in which they are saying now, the culture is saying now, no, there is a meta narrative, and here's what it is. Okay? But previously, it had been no, there's no universal truth. There's no meta tariff. There's nothing overflowing everything, which, of course, is nonsense. Um, but again, there's this, 
un distrust in every institution, including churches. So this is the reason why it's oftentimes more difficult for us. In other words, this is a different age that we live in, especially for young people. It's a different age. It just is. Um, because everything that that for young people is, is music, movies, you name it, and so forth, it's just completely different. That's the reason why we as a church are really striving to revamp our children's ministries and do something special. We're looking to hire our children's minister. All these things that we're trying to do and understanding that we need to reach children for Christ. And so um, this is something that this is where our culture is. This is what they hold on to. This is where they're going. And so as a result, what you see, for instance, if you've invited somebody, I'm sure you probably have invited somebody, a young person to church, especially, but maybe even somebody that's older. And they're, when they hear about it, it's just kind of like, well, uh, thanks, but no thanks. You've got your thing. That's good. That's wonderful for you. I've got my thing. It may be uh, some type of civic club. It may be uh, involved in this or that. It may be involved going and carrying my kids to big ones, such as carrying my kids to soccer, athletics, and so forth. I'm so busy with that over there. I'm glad that you have your, your truth. I'm glad that you have your, your thing. But this is what I'm involved in. Now, for those of us who are Christians, who are believers, we know and understand that that's not the way it is. This is more than just a thing that we do. This is the central focus of our lives. And so it's important to know and understand that. It's important to grasp hold of these things and to know where we are in our approach. The second thing, though, is oftentimes, along with this not so much caring about church is what they see churches is as power. And so what they, when you invite them to church, they're seeking, they, they think that all you want to do is have them be another person, another, another number in the pew. Now, we need to stop a minute here and talk about that because there's a certain extent that that's true. To a certain extent that churches, we as churches, and especially I as pastors, we want people to feel the pew so that we can build better and bigger things, pay the pastor a bigger salary, you name it. And we talked to this, when we talked about the church, about the importance of understanding that it's not about putting people in the pew, but it's about being God's witnesses, it's about discipling people about seeking to be used by God to grow his kingdom. Yes, people in the pew are great. It enables us to do more and bigger things. Great and wonderful. But that can never be the focus of the church. And when you invite people within your heart and your mind, you need to have an understanding of that. That your, your purpose when you invite people, because they see through it, constantly. They'll see through it just like that because they're looking for that. And they're thinking that all you're doing is just inviting me so that you can just fill me in as a pew so that I can be another part of your organization. That's what the way postmoderns think. That's the way movies, TV, social media, radio, you name it. This is, that's the message that they're consistently constantly getting across distrust in all institutions, but especially Christian ones like ours, in which we claim truth, in which we seek to disciple people, in which we seek to add numbers. Adding numbers is great. It's a wonderful thing. It's something we should do, something we should long for. But we do it for the sake of the glory of Christ. We do it for the sake of reaching other people for Jesus. We do it for the sake of seeking to be used by God to grow his kingdom. That's the reason why we do it, and that's the biblical reason why we do it. Now, with all that being said, again, this is, so that I want you to understand that it's, it's a much different culture than the way it was, say, 40, 50, 30, 20, even 10 years ago. And so it's, it's different, and, and our approach might be different. But 
first of all, we need to understand, okay, how can you reach somebody like this that's caught up in all of this, this, this understanding of everything when you're not even kind of on the same page? When you're talking, you're talking over each other, when you, you say this is truth and they're like, no, this is not what everything else around me says. That's not what TV, radio, news, you name it. That's not what all that says. And of course, it goes even so much, as we'll talk about a little bit more next week, it goes even so much that, that oh, I can change my gender. Um, my, my truth is, is apart from the biblical view of sexuality and so forth. Um, and then especially when we as churches stay, seek to stay true to Scripture, that's far different. And the tendency for us, the culture around us, to once they know and understand our biblical stance on things, is to say thanks but no thanks, even maybe hostility. So uh, all this, these things are really, really important to know and understand as we talk about reaching out to people, as we talk about sharing the gospel with the lost or who in the dying world. And Ecclesiastes, I think, is really can really speak to people who are caught up in postmodernism. Um, again, it's one of my favorite books of the scripture. Uh, and I say that people like, okay, if you say so. Um, but uh, it really is. Um, in fact, I was talking with, with Mike yesterday, and he's like, yeah, that's my favorite book of the Bible as well. It's like, no wonder we're such kindred spirits. Um, but I, I took a course under under a, an amazing guy um, went to college, and he talked about Ecclesiastes, and he was kind of this world-renowned expert in Ecclesiastes. And of course, most likely, uh, if not, you could say almost definitively, uh, Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. If you know anything about Solomon, he started off very well, but then he got caught up in a lot of different things, and he had everything and everything that a person could ask for. But by the end of his life, I think he can realize that all of it was meaningless. It was vanity. But this, this uh, Dr. Hendricks was his name, and he talked, though, about the translations. Oftentimes in Ecclesiastes, you hear vanity, right? Meaninglessness. And that's an okay translation, but he said what it really should be translated is <sighs> breath. But not even translated as just breath. It should be translated as <sighs> in other words, here, right now, and gone. Just like that. And that's the point. So, like for instance, Ecclesiastes 1-2 should literally be translated as <sighs> of <sighs> says the preacher <sighs> of <sighs> all is <sighs> in other words, everything is here today and gone tomorrow. And especially when you look at, if you do this apart from Christ, it's vanity. It's meaningless. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And that's the whole point of Ecclesiastes, pointing us towards the fact that we don't, want, we don't need to live a life that's just meaningless, that's vanity, that we don't need to live a life apart from Christ, apart from God. That there is eternal truth, and that eternal truth is found in Jesus Christ. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 3. I'll read the whole chapter. But as you're reading this, I want you to think about how, how would this really impact the people around me, especially those that are affected by this, this philosophy called postmodernism, which they say there is no such thing as truth. Um, and how would this specifically speak to them? Hear now the word of God, Ecclesiastes 3, chapter verse 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, and a time to lose. A time to keep, 
and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time of peace. What gain has the worker from his toll? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find, find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them to be joyful, to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toll. That is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear, fear before him. That is, already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Wherever I saw under the sun, in the place of justice, that there was wickedness, the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man, what happens to the beast, is the same as one dies, so does the other, so, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. And all go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust they all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? And then, Father, this morning, we just lift this, this text up to you and ask you that um, we would understand it, that we would grasp hold of it, and that we would come before you and understand your word and seek to apply it to our lives so that we, in turn, might share the love of Christ with those that so desperately need it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, for one thing, I, I, okay, I'll okay, i strive to be shorter because I know we spent more time uh, talking about postmodernism than, than expounding the text. So we're not going to spend as much time as we usually do kind of expounding the text and applying it. But we do need to talk about it. One thing that I think will help us understand about how this text will affect those who've been kind of caught up in this postmodernism thing is understanding about the way that most people think it all began. There was this housing project, I won't try to, to tell you the name of it, uh, but this housing project in the middle of St. Louis, I believe, um, that was what was called a modernist approach to it. And it, by modernist approach, I mean it didn't into it take account human beings. And so it was all structure, and it was all reasoning, and it was all like keeping people separate, and there was nothing in it that was um, acknowledged humanity itself. The way it looked, the way the architecture was, of how there was no interconnection between anybody and everybody, and when that failed and they destroyed it, I mean, a lot of money was put into it and it failed and they destroyed it. A lot of people think that was kind of the start to postmodernism, which tells you something. It tells you that what postmodernism is, is this um, attempt to right or wrong. Um, because it's an attempt to say, okay, there's something to be said for humanity, for gathering into groups, for cherishing each other, for community. Um, that's vitally, vitally, vitally important. And that's one of the things I said in the newsletter is postmodernism is not all wrong because one of the things it does is it 
attempts to be more community minded. It attempts to to uh, have connections and have stories and so forth. And that's good. But anytime non Christians take an approach to things, even for us as Christians, we could do the same thing apart from Christ, apart from God's word, they get it, they twist things in different ways. It's a good thing to want community. It's a good thing to to desire that. But in order to do that, though, they rejected truth. They said there is no such thing as truth. You have your truth, I have my truth, and on and on it goes, right? And so they, in itself, rejected truth. But this, anytime you come across to somebody a non-Christian, and they react in this way, understanding that they're trying to solve some type of problem within their head apart from Christ. And there's a sense in which God has laid that out for us. And the text shows kind of, okay, and this the, the first part is often meant to be, okay, there's a time for you to do these things, there's a time for you to do these things. That's not what it says. In other words, there's a time that, Things happen to us in our lives. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to plank up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal. In other words, these things are more oftentimes what happens in life as it is. There's times of joy, there's times of sadness. And for people, and we as believers, no one understand that we cling to Christ. And he goes on and he talks about work. Again, you think about work and you need to think about the curse. The curse that happened way back in Genesis. How God cursed man and all his toll within and struggle and everything that he does. And so this is important to know and understand. And so what really Ecclesiastes seemed to be saying is that God has put things like that here, the struggles that people face in life, in order for us to have eternity set within our hearts, in order that we might look around and say, you know, there's got to be something more than, than just this. And that's what postmodernists did when they came to the kind of rational, modernistic view of just intellectual, not taking in human emotions. They had looked around and said, you know, there's got to be something more. And that's true. That's right. But... Oftentimes, even us as Christians, what we tend to do is we tend to react in ways that's not what God, the way God wants us to, the way God desires us to do. And so there's in a sense in which God places eternity within people's hearts when they see something, as we'll see next week, especially when it comes to ethics and morals. There's something in mankind that says, wait a minute, this isn't right. Let me correct it. There's a sense in which that's good. Okay? But when you and I, as Christians and believers, see those things and see something wrong within our hearts or within society, we go according to God's word. Again, what the culture did, I think, is the culture saw something, a modernist approach, only rationalist approach, and not taking the human emotions, and then said, okay, in order to do that, then we have to say there's no such thing as truth. We have to take away God's truth. That's the reason why I say to you all the time, look, we have to take an intellectual approach to Scripture, but we also have to take an emotional approach to Scripture to see them both, and understand them both, and apply them to us both. And this is what... what Solomon does later on in his life. And he really sees this. And he really sees that the questions that people have are just God-given questions of where, what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of even all this toll under the sun of the riches that I, that I have? It all seems meaningless. It all seems vanity. And that, yes, that's the point. Without God in one's life, it is without meaning, without purpose. But Solomon would say, I understand that the restlessness that you have, the restlessness that I have, the restlessness that young people have, or, or whatever, 
they're caught up in such things that they see injustices. They see uh, only a rational approach to life. And it's like, yes, that's right. That's good. But also understand that there is a truth and the truth is found in Scripture. And it's real important for us to know and understand that. And this is what this, this passage I really think is pointing us toward. I mean, by the end, he says, so I, verse 22, so I saw that there's nothing better than the man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Ah, this is lot in life. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? So he's asking the question to you and I that there's people that go throughout their lives and they just see their lot in their life. They go to work. They, they, they go and, uh, I don't know, have seek their best to have joy in life. And oftentimes it's through other means, um, whatever it is, whether it's pornography, um, sex, you name it. And he's like, okay, these people, they go through life there's got to be somebody who comes along and t- tries to get them to understand what's going to come after this because there is going to be something after this. And God has set in, in our hearts and our minds this, this understanding if we listen to it, if we listen to Scripture, that yes, there is. And that is found in Jesus Christ. That's found in Scripture. And so this whole passage really seems to, again, we don't have time to, as much time to dig into it and understand it and understand, apply it. But the whole point of it all really seems to be saying all these things that we do, whether we have silence, speak, love, hate, have war, peace, you name it, all these things point to something greater. The toll, the strife that you now face, the joy, the tears, all this points to something greater. The fact that there is something more to this life. There's something more than just a rational way of thinking. There's emotions. It points us that we have a creator, that God has created us, and that there is a truth. As the Bible talks about, there's a time appointed for man to die the truth and reality for every single human being. And every single human being, myself included, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Solomon, at the end of his life, is looking at how he wasted his life. And his desire is writing the whole book, is pointing out, look, don't waste your life the way that I did. If you will, look at the end of the book, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. And this is our message. Um, and before we read this, I want to say one more kind of a powerful thing as we think about postmodernism. Again, as I said, not everything about postmodernism is bad. Because what postmodernism desires, instead of just the rational thing, is, is it wants community. It wants heart. It wants people who share their hearts with each other. That's real important. And it's important, for instance, for we do things as a church, such as we eat afterwards. We gather together in fellowship. It's important that we do other things as we we fellowship with each other. It's important that we that we as a church family I heard a lot of talk, um, wonderful before church. I think that's great and wonderful. It shows a community and it's a community that we desire to tell other people about. And it's so important, for instance, things like Door of Hope, and you come in, and this is specifically towards non-Christians, but anybody and everybody is involved. In fact, need to be involved, need to come, because, again, we're seeking to develop this community. That's what postmoderns want. That's the, what postmoderns drift towards, is a community. That's the reason why you often see churches rename themselves this community church, this community church. You can have the name community in it, but it's important that, that we have actually have this community as a church and we use this community to reach out to other people. That's the reason why VBS, for instance, we have a meal beforehand. It's an opportunity in a society that so desperately desires community that's on their phones and on social media and all this other stuff 
they are oftentimes desperate, desperate for a community, desperate to sit down with people and to share a meal with people. That's the reason, one of the reasons why we wanted to have a meal beforehand, so that we can do that, so that we can share a meal with other people and we can tell them how much they're loved through Jesus. But Ecclesiastes points us all this towards, towards this, all this, and understanding. And our, our message is that life without Christ is vain. Life without Jesus is, ah, it's here today and gone tomorrow. But by the end of the book, he says, the end of the matter, and this is, this is essentially the gospel in Old Testament form, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God, in other words, understand that, that you are a sinner and you need a savior and you need to fear him and have reverence for him. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed in judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So in understanding that, again, there is a truth, regardless of what people and culture around you and I is telling us, there is a truth. And that as scripture points out, everything will be brought into judgment. That is what postmodernism, that is what the world around, that's what they detest. In saying that all these things, there's a certain truth and everything will be brought into a judgment, namely the God of the Bible, namely that of Jesus Christ, with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And that's important for us to know and understand. And it's important for us to share this message. One final thing before we close. Um, I shared with you before, Jay Gresham Machen, kind of the, the leader of uh, that started the movement away from the PCUSA. And, and it's something that we, as in our denomination, the EPC, Evangelical Presbyterian Church, something that we look towards. And, a hero of ours, um, and he struggled with, with in his day, the, the liberal thoughts and ideas that, that came around. Um, they were different, it's different than it is today, but one of the things though, well two things, number one, um, he noticed, he went to Germany and he noticed how different the people, the, the people were that were teaching him he studied theology there, and they were warm, inviting, had this kind of community feel to it. But the very liberal in their approach to scriptures, very, very liberal. In other words, they cast aside a lot of God's word, but they were warm and inviting. He compared that to back home, where he sent in preachers who were cold. They taught the truth but there was no sense of emotion at all. And he pointed out that just the need for creatures to have emotion as well and warmth themselves as well as churches. But the other thing is though is he never, and this is important, he never looked down upon people who struggled with the philosophies of his day because he himself almost went that direction as well. In the same way, you and I do not, the easy thing can be for us as we see, and especially this is true next week, we'll talk about it. It's, it's an easy thing to be extremely harsh and unloving and saying to ourselves, look at these people, look at what they're doing. How awful. Rather, we should have compassion for them and love towards them. That's so, so, so vitally important. Uh, look, as much as, because I don't know if you wouldn't understand, again, big words, but I don't know if you realize how postmodernism and our correlation now metamodernism, as we'll talk about next week, has infiltrated into everything that you see, do, or watch. If you turn on the TV on any channel, it's there. It's some limit. Now, some more than others, but it's there in your work, academics, uh, you name it, it's there. You can't escape from it. Again, some worse than others, 
but it's there. Name an institution, name something, and this has infected us all. Listen to me. It would be easy for me, easy for you, to fall into that same trap. And that's important that we don't. We pay attention to Colossians 2.8. We don't fall prey to those things in our lives. But it's important to know and understand that especially, I mean, we have God's truth. We have the word of God, right? And even sometimes we fall into these traps. I do. You might. And so when we see the world go against scripture, against things that we don't believe in, there should be a response of love and kindness and compassion and willingness to share the gospel with them. And again, they desire community. They desire, that's what they're looking for. So as a church, whether it's through our children's ministries, uh, you name it, that's our goal. It's to love people. And the world has a different view of what love is. We'll talk about that, especially next week. But it's important, vitally important for you and I, myself, especially myself as the pastor, but us all, that we understand that people struggle. How can they not struggle? Because it's everywhere around. And so in love and compassion towards people, we seek to share the word of God, the word of truth, and in a community that not only loves each other, but loves them as well, as we share Jesus Christ with the lost and hurting and dying world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that in a topsy-turvy world that we live in, we can lean upon you in every single thing that we do. And we pray, Lord, that as a church family, that we would grasp hold of you and we would love and cherish you all our days. And, Lord, we, we live in an age in which everything around us strays from scripture and our hearts are burdened by that Lord we cannot we must not give in to what the culture is telling us but we rather be faithful to, to your word as we're faithful to your word that also means that we're faithful and loving people not being harsh towards them but understanding for we ourselves could be caught up in the spirit of the age, whatever it is, because it's all around us. But let's stay true to your scripture, true to your word, and in doing so, we pray that we love and we cherish you. That we love and cherish other people as they are made in your image. And throughout it all, we share the amazing gospel of Christ the world that so desperately needs it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand if you are able. Lord, look upon my need. I need you, I need you, Lord, have mercy now on me, forgive me, oh Lord, forgive me, and I will be
my way. There is nothing here from you. Oh, Lord, you know the number of my days. I want to live my life for you. Lord, look upon my Now on me, forgive me, oh Lord, forgive me, and I will be clean. Oh Lord, you are familiar with my ways. There is nothing here from you. to live my life for you. Oh, Lord, you are familiar with my ways. There is nothing here from you. Oh, Lord, you know the number of my days. I want to live my life for you. Say now the benediction, that to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority for all time, and around and forever.